My mom, she needed a ride now to church, but now North Shore by then mer was almost merging with uh, Norwood Bible Church in the uh, northwest part of the city. And so I thought, all right, as a son, I need to do my duty, and I better bring my mom to church. And so I'm now stuck there Sunday mornings, you know, at church. And, uh, you know, I didn't mind, but, uh, you know, I kind of wasn't all that interested. Uh, as a youngster, I was fortunate to learn about grace, but maybe I didn't take it as seriously and didn't appreciate it. And so my mom then decided, well, you know, you need to drive me to church on Wednesday nights. So now she's got me hooked. I got to drive her Wednesday nights. And, you know, I kind of resisted that a little bit. Long story short, I uh, started uh, taking my mom to Wednesday night meetings. And Brother Richard started teaching a series called Eternal Glory. And uh, that series is what just sort of... Uh, caused me to get serious about Bible study. And so, of course, I want to express my gratitude to Brother Richard and for his ministry, the impact that he had. And uh, if it wasn't for him, uh, quite frankly, I, I don't think I would be here. So I certainly want to express my uh, gratitude and appreciation for that. By the way, uh, I met my wife at uh, Shorewood as well, so that was also <laughs> important. All right, enough of that. Uh, turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, I, will like, uh, I would like to read verses 1 through verse 5. Uh, we've already read the passage the last couple of nights. Uh, but uh, my topic for this evening has to do, obviously, with the, this great mystery, specifically, when was it revealed, okay? And we'll read here once again, Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father, once again. We do thank you for who you are as a loving God of grace, manifesting uh, your mercy, your long-suffering. We thank you, Father, for uh, the gift of eternal life, and we also thank you for your word that uh, obviously equips us uh, to be vessels that you use. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for the revelation of the mystery, how it is you have an eternal purpose and our place and participation in it all. We pray that our time together would be edifying, refreshing, encouraging, and of course, we ask it in Christ Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. I think by now, we have identified four undeniable truths. We can identify clearly four specific truths in this passage. Number one, we clearly understand that there is something that was hidden. Secondly, we understand that something was hidden from men. Thirdly, we know that something was hidden in God. And then fourthly, which is the topic that I was assigned, uh, it's no longer hidden. There's something that is now being revealed, being made known. We're talking about the great mystery and I do want to clarify something here. When we suggest that there was a time in which it was revealed, we're not implying that there was a singular point in history that the entire package of mystery truth was revealed. When we talk about when it was revealed, we're not suggesting that at one sitting, God deposited all of this glorious truth, this uh, body of information at any one time to the Apostle Paul. We do recognize that the revelation of the mystery occurs over a period of time. It was progressive in nature. So we don't have a month, a day, or a year that we're going to uh, look at as the point in time when the revelation was made known. In fact, just so that we understand that revelation was given to Paul over a period of time, 
couple of verses very quickly. If you turn to Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, and then also turn, please, with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, Acts chapter 26, and then we're going to compare that with what the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice in Acts chapter 26, verse uh, 16, Acts chapter 26, verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto to thee. So obviously the Apostle Paul can already anticipate further appearings by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice what he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So even as Paul writes this letter, sometime during that Acts 18 to chapter 20 period, even at that time, Paul is anticipating future visions and revelations from the Lord. So Paul's own testimony is that the information is being given gradually and progressively over time. And it's interesting uh, how Paul describes what's happening when he comes to these visions and revelations. Just drop down to verse 4. How that he, and I do believe Paul is talking about himself, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words. Now, think about that for just a second. He's hearing something, correct? He describes whatever it is he's hearing as words but he describes them as unspeakable words. Keep your finger here. Go over to Acts chapter 22 very quickly, uh, just so that we get a feel for what it is Paul is describing as he is privileged to communicate face-to-face -face with the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is receiving information that Paul describes as being unlawful for men to utter. Well, then who's talking to him? Just think about that. Doesn't Paul say in Galatians chapter 1 that the information that he preached was not after man? Now, that's kind of interesting when you think about this. No one was allowed to communicate this information until the Lord Jesus personally communicates this information to the Apostle Paul. Notice there in Acts chapter 22, verse 14. Acts 22, verse 14. So just imagine, uh, obviously there in 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul is literally there in paradise. And what an absolute bummer when he had to come back, okay? He's there in glory. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Paul says, listen, I'm in a strait betwixt two. I mean, there was a tug of war that he experienced. And uh, what was it that he was in a strait betwixt? Hey, having a desire to depart and to be where? With Christ, which is far better. But it was more needful, obviously, for Paul to have to return. Um, I'm sure he wasn't the most ecstatic individual at that moment. However, he understood the importance of having to come back and to continue on in that ministry. But while he's up there, notice Acts chapter 22, verse 14. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee that thou shouldst know his will and see that just one and shouldest hear the voice of of his mouth. Paul is hearing words. They're unspeakable words, but it's unlawful for a man to utter who's talking. The words are coming straight out of the mouth of who? The Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So what I just want to press at the outset is there is no singular point in time in which the Apostle Paul receives the entire package of revelation. 
we need to understand the progressive nature. And the reason for that is there are things that Paul does in the book of Acts, for example. There are some things that he's writing about uh, in the uh, mid-Acts period that, are, that is superseded by further revelation. Okay, And I just want to make that very clear. Uh, especially when you're studying the book of Acts. There are some things that Paul is doing, saying, and uh, 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 communicating that is in line with a very specific ministry given to him in light of Israel's fall diminishing. Okay, So, with all of that, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 3 now. All right, So, okay, we, we recognize that this revelation... Uh, is given over time. He did come to visions and uh, revelations, okay? Now, what we're going to concentrate on specifically this evening is when did it all begin? Now, notice when we read there in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, beginning there at verse 1, there are nine personal pronouns, okay? Uh, look there at verse 1 real quick. For this cause, notice, I, Paul. At the end of verse 2, uh, uh, God which is given me to you word. Look there at the end of verse 3. Unto me, the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Verse 4, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Drop down to verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And then uh, verse 8, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach. Why is it that Paul, by the way, you read Romans through Philemon, Paul continuously always refers to himself. He, he uses these personal pronouns, me, mine, my. Why does Paul do that? Is he some um, narcissist? Is he just full of himself? And I trust we'll recognize that is simply not the case. It's critically important to recognize there is something unique happening with and through the Apostle Paul, okay? Now, look back there at verse 5. Talking about this mystery, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed, okay? So when we try to identify when is this mystery being revealed, we see that language in verse 5, uh, as it is now. Now, that's a word that is used repeatedly in the book of Ephesians, by the way. If you turn over to chapter 2, uh, look there in chapter 2, verse 13. Notice, but now, drop down to verse 19. Now, therefore, chapter 3, verse 10, to the intent that now under the principality. So, so a number of times, Paul uses that designation, now. So when Paul talks about when this revelation is being made known, he is certainly saying that something is being revealed now. And he already mentions there again in chapter 3, verse 5, as it is now being revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, there is a bit of controversy over what exactly Paul is writing here in verse 5. Now, I don't recommend you uh, study all these commentaries, but out of curiosity, I referred to, I think, 19 different commentaries just to get an idea of what is commonly taught about this verse. And out of those 19 commentaries, I only found one that actually got it right. Okay? Verse 5 is sometimes interpreted to mean that, well, in 
time past, there were individuals that were privy, privy to some of the information that the Apostle Paul was given. In other words, the way it is sometimes read, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now being revealed. But the implication is that, you know, some of this information was made known to perhaps a select few in time past. Now, there's a difference in how you use that word as. Now, it's obviously verse 4. In other ages, it was not made known unto the sons of men. By the way, some say, oh, the sons of men. That's a reference to the unbeliever. In other words, in the past, God did not make this information known to the unbeliever as it's being revealed now to the holy apostles and prophets. Well, that, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That, uh, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But that is a way people who are opposed to dispensationalism will interpret verse 5. There's a real hang-up when we as dispensationalists insist that this secret package of information, this mystery, was first revealed to and through the Apostle Paul, they cry foul. They say, no, Paul was not the first individual to receive this revelation of the mystery. And they will suggest that there were people in the past that actually did know something about it, but now it's being revealed in a different way. Now, that's one way of reading the verse. The word as is sometimes used in verse 5 in that comparison way. In other words, well, uh, it was revealed in the past, just not the same way it's being revealed today. Okay? But Paul's not making a comparison. He's making a contrast. If I were to say to you that the citizens of ancient Rome did not have cell phones as we do, am I implying that the citizens of ancient Rome used to have cell phones? No, you understand. I'm using it as a contrast. What's happening now is different than certainly things were happening in the past, okay? So you kind of wonder, well, if they insist that there were perhaps a select few in the past that were privy to some of this information, how would they defend that line of reason? And believe it or not, it's kind of, kind of strange what theologians will do. Here are a couple of examples. Go to Amos chapter 3. Go to Amos chapter 3. I just wanted to... Uh, to share with you some of the passages that, that I bumped into, just trying to get a feel for what is commonly taught in the ranks of Christendom, uh, what tradition will sometimes teach when it comes to distinct information. When we claim and we defend Paul's unique apostleship, and to Paul alone was this information first revealed, uh, whether it's Reformed theology, I don't care what, it, they, they just go bananas because they flat out reject the premise that something new is happening in and through the Apostle Paul. So when you start talking about secrets, and by the way, we're not going to talk about, I, the Brother uh, uh, Dave on Saturday evening, Brother Richard last night, it's, it's obvious there is such a thing as a secret. Okay, we understand that, right? Uh, the secret was hid where, according to Ephesians chapter 3? It was hid in God, okay? Uh, the preaching of Jesus Christ, uh, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept, what, sec who kept this secret? God kept this secret. It was hid in God. So there is such a thing as a secret. But watch out. You find the word secret in the Old Testament. Now you know what happens if you wrongly handle God's word. Just because you run across the word secret does not mean by default that's what Paul's talking about. Here's one example. Amos, 
chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. Notice verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the who? So if you're lazy or if you're unskilled, I think that's a politer way of saying it. If you're unskilled in studying God's word, by the way, we know the method we're supposed to use. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, you won't fall into this trap. So when Paul talks about how it is now revealed to the holy apostles and prophets, well, isn't there something here about a secret being revealed to who? The pro well, there you go. You see, God in the past, he revealed a secret. Is Paul the first one to receive this secret? Now, those who oppose dispensationalism, they'll try to use this verse, but now hold on here for just a second. What is it that verse 7 is talking about? And you always have to understand the context in which any verse is given, correct? What we have beginning in verse 1 is a series of cause and effect. What God is communicating to Israel is this. Listen, nothing happens without a cause, okay? And that's exactly how the verse uh, the chapter begins, verse 1, hear the word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel. So we, we know who, can God have a secret in the prophetic program? Now he's talking to Israel, and, and here we go. Now, now notice how Amos is going to deal. Verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all of your iniquities. Right now, we've set the context. Is this going to be a good chapter for Israel? Or is there a problem that Israel's facing, okay? So, verse 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? No. Verse 4, will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? No. Will a, will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? No. Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? No. So what we have, listen, there is cause and effect. What would cause a lion to roar? Well, if, as the verse says, he hath prey. If he doesn't have prey, he's not going to roar. So for every cause, there is an effect, okay? That's what's happening in this context. So ultimately, by the time we get to verse 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing. There is no effect unless there's a cause. So what is it verse 7 is communi communi communicating here? Surely the Lord will, God will do nothing, but he's revealing his secret unto the servants, his prophets. What God is communicating through Amos is quite simple. The Lord doesn't do anything without just cause. And what God is now communicating to Israel is he has just cause to punish them. And what this secret is all about, the calamities that Israel is experiencing is not without warning. God has provided warning. He has consistently told Israel, you persist in sin, iniquity, and rebellion, and what's going to happen to you? I'm going to punish you, okay? Right. Now, the secret that this particular verse is concentrating on is God is revealing to his prophets how he's going to punish Israel. Can, you, can God reveal information to Israel that he didn't previously reveal within the context of her prophetic program. You see, verses 9 through 15 is the secret. So just think about that. God is saying, I'm going to reveal a secret through my prophets. I am going to punish you for your iniquities, and this is how I'm going to do it. He is telling Israel this is the way, this is the means by which I'm going to punish you 
for your iniquities. Now, that's a real stretch to suggest, oh, the prophets are learning about this new one body, this new dispensational period. You see, that's grasping for straws. That's desperation. Uh, go over to Isaiah. Here's another passage that, uh, I, again, I mean, you can Google it if you want to, you know, just kind of get a feel for how some would handle that verse back there in Ephesians chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 48. In Isaiah chapter 48, and notice in verse 16, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16. Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in what? You see, God doesn't keep all of these secrets. Again, if you're opposed to dispensationalism, uh, here's a verse that says, I, I don't speak in secret. But now we're reading about a mystery. We're reading about information that was kept secret since the foundation of the world. So what is Isaiah 48, verse 16 dealing with? Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was, there am I, and now the Lord God and his spirit hath sent me. Okay? All right. What is it that God is communicating? Look there at verse 6, chapter 48, verse 6. Thou hast heard, see all this, and will not ye declare it? I have showed thee new things from this time, even hidden things. Now, isn't that language that the Apostle Paul uses? It was hidden God? What is the mystery? Isn't it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 called the hidden, hidden wisdom? So here we have uh, uh, the Lord declaring that even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. God is saying, I've revealed this. The problem is Israel's fault. Well, what is this hidden information? What is it that God said, I'm not keeping something secret from you? And, and, and this is a no-brainer. Look there at verse 4. Because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass, I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou should say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. What the Lord is doing is he's providing details about future events, lest Israel give the credit to what? The false gods. So God is revealing a hidden thing. That is various events, various activities, various behaviors. God is prophesying and foretelling and predicting in advance things that are going to happen in Israel so that Israel doesn't give credit to the graven image. So can God reveal a hidden thing? Well, obviously, but in the context, is that the same as saying that what Isaiah is talking about is this hidden body of information for, given to the Apostle Paul? Absolutely not. Now, there are a couple of other examples, but let's go to Matthew chapter 13. This one, this one is used quite frequently by those who are very antagonistic to dispensationalism. And uh, perhaps you run into this verse and you scratch your head a little bit, Matthew chapter 13. And remember here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 35, Matthew 13, verse 35, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter, utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now, what verse does that one sound like? Keep your finger there. Go to Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now, wait a minute. Paul writes about this mystery in verse 25 of chapter 16. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since when? 
the world began. Well, now read Matthew 13 again. Matthew 13, the end of verse 30, or the second half of verse 35. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the what? Well, there you have it. If you're a Reformed theologian, if you're uh, an evangelical, you see that? There's no difference between what Jesus Christ is saying here in Matthew 13 and what the Apostle Paul is writing to the Romans. Listen, God is already revealing the secret through Jesus Christ, the secret which the Lord's dealing with. It was kept since when? You, you see the similar language? You see how they now can try to argue? How in the world can we teach that with Paul it's completely different? when you have identical language. Now, what is it that the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here? Notice right off the bat, at the end of the verse, he says, I will utter, utter things, plural, which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. In the context, what things is the Lord Jesus Christ uttering? You know what he's doing in Matthew chapter 13. I, I hope you go over to verse uh, uh, 10. Look there at verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Is there some information that the Lord Jesus Christ is now communicating to the nation of Israel in the context of the prophetic program regarding the establishment of a kingdom, a heavenly kingdom where? On the earth. Yes, the Lord Jesus is communicating information by way of what? According to verse 10. Parables. There are seven parables that the Lord has given. There are seven mysteries that the Lord is teaching. There are seven details about the end times of the prophetic program. There are seven secrets, information regarding the end times that he is now communicating to the little flock specifically. There's a difference between God revealing secrets within a dispensation and God revealing an entire dispensation as a secret. You see the difference? Don't, don't get too stirred up when the Lord's talking about, I'm going I'm to tell you some secrets that have been kept secret since the foundation of the world. Now, one other point. Uh, go back to verse 35 very quickly. Look there at verse 35 again. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret. So the Lord is communicating information by way of parable. What's the purpose of a parable? Hey, unto you, little flock, it is given to know the mysteries, but unto them, the unbelieving apostate nation of Israel, I don't want them to understand this information. It's not given to them. The Lord Jesus is quoting Psalms chapter 78. Just real quick, go to Psalms chapter 78. When the Lord Jesus explains why he's divulging information that is called secret, notice what we read in Psalms chapter 78. Psalms chapter 78. And interestingly enough, Look there at verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to, my, to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have, what? Heard and known. And our fathers have told us. But look at verse 4. We will not hide them from their children. Drop down to verse 8. And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, whose spirit was not steadfast with God. You know what the Lord is doing? He is quoting this passage to explain why he's using the parable methodology. 
when using the parable, he is uttering dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known. But what is the fundamental problem with the nation of Israel at large? They're unbeliever. They're not faithful. They're in rebellion. They're not communicating the details. They're not transmitting the, the information. They are, as verse 8 describes, they're stubborn. They're rebellious. They don't set their heart aright. This is information that the Lord was communicating, but in response to Israel's obstinate, stiff-necked, rebellious, hard heart, guess what God does? You know, God can hide information. He can hide information because of blindness. He can hide information because of unbelief. You know how the Lord dealt with Israel oftentimes? In fact, the Lord in Matthew 13, he actually does quote Isaiah where he says, I'm going to give you eyes so that you can't see and I'm going to give you ears that you can't hear and I'm going to give you a heart so that you cannot what? Understand. You know what the Lord Jesus is doing? Listen, this information is information that was should have been known, it should have been taught, it should have been made available, details that the Lord desired to divulge, but because of unbelief, guess what the Lord does? He suppresses some of this information. So what the Lord Jesus is simply doing is, he is now uttering this truth. He's uttering this information he is, in Matthew 13, by way of seven parables, revealing, divulging seven secrets. Now, we're not going to look at exactly what these seven secrets are. But again, God can reveal information within the dispensation. Didn't he do that with Daniel? Didn't Daniel declare God in Daniel chapter 2 as a revealer of what? Secrets. So yeah, God can hide some information. He can divulge information. He can keep a secret. He can reveal a secret. That is not what Paul, the apostle, is talking about. Go back to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, God can reveal information in a dispensation if he chose to hide it. That is not the same as God divulging for the very first time a brand new dispensational purpose. And what Paul is describing in Ephesians 3 is clearly a brand new dispensational purpose. Notice what he says there in verse 2. Ephesians 3 verse 2. If he have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me, the mystery. Before anyone gets hung up on verse 5, look at verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. Listen, verse 5 comes after, and I'm not trying to insult, comes after verse 2. Verse 5 is subsequent to verse 2. Verse 5 is after verse 2. Who is the first one to receive this body of truth? Paul. After Paul is given those unspeakable words that came out of whose mouth? Jesus Christ. While Paul is literally face-to-face -face communion, whether it is through a vision, a dream, or that one instance where he's literally transported into paradise. He's hearing from the Lord directly, and it's unlawful for a man to utter it. So Paul's the first to receive it. After Paul is receiving it, then guess how the Lord is revealing the, these truths. By his spirit, he's revealing this information to the holy apostles and prophets, okay? Now, I want to really emphasize the fact that it begins with the apostle Paul. The que when is this mystery revealed? God does it in a very special way. Not, not a unique way, by the way. 
You know, the means by which God draws attention to the revelation of the mystery, the means by which God draws attention to the dispensation of the grace of God is through the conversion and commissioning of Paul. That's how he draws attention to it. Now you understand why Paul's always talking about his apostleship. He's always talking about his ministry. He's always talking about my gospel. I, me, my. God deliberately draws the church's attention to this new program via this individual. You know, God did that before. You know that God used an historic figure to draw attention to another dispensational program? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter, look, it's not the first time God has done this. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, notice what we read here. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And let's begin at verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1. Now, Deuteronomy 4, verse 1. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you. By the way, you know who's talking here? Who? Moses. Okay. So, now, now you have Moses. So, Israel is to hearken to the statutes and to the judgments that who's teaching this? Moses. I teach you for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command. Who is issuing the command to the nation of Israel? Who's Moses? Man, boy, they worship Moses, right? You know, we, we, you, you, I'm sure any of you come out of Roman Catholicism, right? Mary, 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 you know. You guys worship Mary. You know what mid you know, we're accused of worshiping who? Uh, okay, you, you understand. Well, wait a minute, what, who's this guy? Moses. How dare Moses claim credit in giving and issuing commands? Verse 2, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish uh, aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Wow, verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded, here we go, me. Doesn't that remind you of what Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 14? He who is spiritual, you know, anybody who thinks he's a prophet, he who thinks he's a uh, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the, of the Lord. And we're going to end this evening, not right now, relax. <laughs> you know that God, God takes this so seriously. We'll see how serious he takes this. You know, the Lord Jesus, go over to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. It, why is it that the Lord Jesus Christ, he too affirms the role that Moses had in Israel's history? Uh, Matthew chapter 8. Notice in Matthew chapter 8, verse 4. Matthew 8, verse 4. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded. Wait a minute. Did Jehovah God command the gifts and the offerings and the sacrificial system? Or did Moses command it? Yes. Both. <laughs> who, who, is, who created the command? But who is the historic figure that God uses to draw attention to the command? He's using Moses. The Lord Jesus is simply reaffirming something here. Moses is an important figure in Israel's life. Not because Moses is the author of the commandments, not because he's the creator of the commandments, but God singles Moses out for a very important reason. Uh, go over to chapter 19. I mean, all over, we, you can read the Gospels, and, and over and over again, the Lord Jesus is always talking about Moses. Matthew chapter 19, verse 7. Matthew chapter 19, verse 7. They say unto him, Why did Moses then... 
command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away. He saith unto them, why in the world are you telling me Moses commanded? No, he says, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. Uh, but from the beginning, it was not so. So uh, you can just go through the Gospels over and over again. The issue is Moses. Now, go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And as I mentioned, God deliberately uses Paul's conversion and commission as an historic point to put some things on display. If we want to identify when did this great secret first begin to be revealed, the scripture is always going to point to Paul. 1 Timothy chapter 1, let's begin there at verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. What Paul does first is disqualify himself from eternal life. This is fascinating. What Paul's going to do is demonstrate that in light of the prophetic program, he was truly a lost hell-bound sinner, okay? Verse 14, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, the Scriptures has more to say about the history, the upbringing of Paul and, and uh, his, his time past career and his conversion on the road to Damascus and the official commission, and the God-given certification of his, more details about Paul than any other human being short of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tremendous detail. Again, you know what God's doing? I'm putting a spotlight on this guy. I'm trying to highlight this guy. And there's a reason for all of that. When Paul in verse 13 says, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Compare that with Galatians chapter 1. We're going to come back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, but go to Galatians chapter 1. Uh, why is Paul stressing who he was in the past? In Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, Paul was a vehement enemy. Of Jesus Christ and we know he was an enemy of Jesus Christ because did not the Lord Jesus in Matthew uh, in, in Acts chapter 9 say Saul Saul why persecutest thou who me but when did Saul of Tarsus ever persecute Jesus of Nazareth so when Paul describes himself as being a persecutor as being injurious he describes it as persecuting the church. Now, why don't we go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. The book of Acts spends time recording Saul and his activities launched against the Lord Jesus and the church, the little flock. In Acts chapter 7, you, you understand that this is... A, a climactic event. I hope you understand what's going on in the first seven chapters, okay? Things are now, it's come to a head. It's a crisis. It is an absolute crisis, okay? And of course, we have here Stephen. He's being stoned to death. And while Stephen is being stoned to death, verse 55 of Acts chapter 7, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God 
and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, okay? Now, I know tradition will teach that Jesus was there to receive Stephen into heaven, okay? And uh, again, uh, not being skillful in what is actually happen, happening. Stephen sees something that the Lord Jesus Christ already said was going to happen when he returns to planet Earth. The Lord Jesus taught clearly in Matthew chapter 25. You know, one day the Son of Man is going to return. And when he returns, he's returning with great power and great glory. And guess who's coming with them? The angels. So you have to just understand what Stephen is witnessing here. When he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God, that's in keeping with what Peter warned Israel about in Acts chapter 2, when Peter describes the Lord Jesus being crucified by wicked hands and how it is the Heavenly Father raised them up from the dead and the Father told his son, Son, you sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy what? Thy footstool, okay? I'm going to make your foes your footstool. So it's quite obvious what's happening here. Stephen is literally seeing the mighty angels of flaming fire that are positioned around the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees the glory of the Son of Man. He's actually witnessing the commencement of the prophetic coming of the Son of Man in catastrophic violence against his enemies. But his enemies, instrumentally, uh, his enemies have launched this campaign of annihilation and genocide instrumentally against who? The little flock. So in light of all of that, look there at verse 58. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. Now that's Stephen, okay? And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was who? Now this, I hope you just grasp what's happening here. Stephen literally sees the prophetic coming of the Son of Man and the mighty angels that are flames of fire. He actually sees, he sees the whole army up there. And while he's being dragged out, and he's going to be stoned to death, we're introduced to who? This, a young man whose name is what? Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his what? Death. And at that, what, who needed his consent? Well, why is it significant to record Saul's consent? Could, could Saul have objected to the stoning of Stephen? Makes you wonder the position that he enjoyed. Ah, what did we read in Galatians 1? Above many mine, what? Equals. Listen, Saul was a ranking zealot. He was a ranking Pharisee. He had the authority not to agree with what was happening. He could have voted nay, but he was consenting unto his death. And the reason he was consenting unto his death is because it's consistent with his personal campaign against those who believed in Jesus of Nazareth. Chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters of Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Drop, drop down to verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man, referring to Saul, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem? Go to chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. God deliberately records in tremendous detail 
the history, the ministry, if you will, the Pharisaic ministry of Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 22, notice there verse 4. Again, Paul recounts who he was. Verse 4, and I persecuted this way unto the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. By the way, Stephen was not an isolated case. There was a campaign already operating to crush those who believe this way. Paul stood there with authority when he consented. Stephen was not an isolated incident at all. This was part of this campaign. And guess who was the chief? See why the Lord, he keeps putting that spotlight on this guy. Verse 5, again, verse 4, And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, and as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders from whom I have received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were they're bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And then chapter 26, chapter 26, uh, and again, verse 4, chapter 26, verse 4, chapter 26, verse 4. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nations at Jerusalem, know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect uh, of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. Drop down to verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which things I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Isn't that what he did with Stephen? Can you, there are a number of members of the little flock that are suffering just like Stephen. Saul happened to be there and he gave his authoritative approval because that's what he was doing. Now, why is that important? Why does the Lord want us to understand that? According to prophecy, there was only one option. Sit thou at my right hand until what? I'm going to make your enemies your foot. I'm going to wipe them all out. There was only one option destroy this flaming rebel. But wait a minute. Go back to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians, that, but, but that isn't what happened. See, according to prophecy, the only recourse was to commence that day of the Lord's wrath. It was to begin the forceful reclamation of governmental control and authority on the earth. And here comes the Son of Man with all of those mighty flaming angels. And they're ready to do it. But you know what God did instead? Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What, what in the world does that have to separated you from your mother's womb? Uh, I know some believe, well, that's talking about the day of his birth. That is not what Paul is describing, and we know that because of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What, what is it, how did God separate Paul, at the time Saul, from his mother's womb? His mother's womb, by the way, in the context is the nation of Israel. Is it good to be separated from your mother's womb? if you belong in your mother's womb? I mean, usually we talk about delivering a baby. Paul isn't describing being delivered. He's describing God reaching down into the womb. And you know what he does? I'm separating. What happens when you separate an embryo? When you separate that fetus from its mother's womb? It dies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. 
You see, the only option in prophecy is it's time for your destruction, Saul. I'm going to destroy the enemies of Israel. I'm going to destroy the enemies of the Christ. I'm going to destroy those who are persecuting my little flock. But God had another option. Acts 9 is the historic point that God puts on display something so radically different Something so radically new, it's not in keeping with the demands of the prophetic program and that intricate, precise clock that God had ticking in early Acts. For Paul to describe himself as one born out of due time. You know what that means if you're not born at the right time? not a good thing. A couple of verses, go to Numbers, Numbers chapter 12. I, I want you to just grasp the language that Paul, that God uses in describing what he did to Saul of Tarsus on that road to Damascus in Numbers chapter 12, verse 12. Numbers 12, 12. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he cometh out of his mother's what? Is this infant coming out of the womb dead or alive? It's dead. What Paul is describing is a violent separation from Israel's identity. You know what God did? He reached down and ripped him out of Israel, his mother's womb. Ripped him out of Israel's prophetic program. Ripped him out of Israel's identity. Do you understand that while we were without strength in due time, Christ was there? You know what? Humanity was on the very precipice of experiencing the outpouring and the outbreak of God's wrath. And instead of God's wrath being poured out against all of humanity, he reached down and he ripped Paul right out of his mother's womb. Go to Job. Job really gets descriptive here. Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3. You know, I was talking to my son the other day, my daughter-in-law, Rachel. She was six months pregnant when she lost uh, little Ezekiel, you know. And, and do you know that they issued, Alex and Rachel, they issued to my son and daughter-in-law, both a birth certificate and a death certificate at the same time. Isn't that interesting? Little Zeke was born dead. You know where our Christian experience, you know where our Christian identity begins? It begins in the graveyard, doesn't it? You know, we're, we're, we're born dead. Uh, doesn't Paul tell us in Romans chapter 6, brother, uh, brother Russ was talking about that earlier. You know what? We, our Origin, our eternal life, our identity begins on a cross. Now, what you talk about being a pattern, Job chapter 3, verse 1. Job chapter 3, verse 1. After this, opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. <laughs> you ever feel like that? Drop down to verse 11. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost? When I came out of the belly. Verse 16. Or as a hidden, untimely birth. You know what it means to be born out of due time? It's an untimely, it's not a normal delivery. It is a stillbirth. You see, God is doing something in Acts chapter 9, and he puts that spotlight on Paul, and he's drawing our attention to his status as a lost, hell-bound chief of sinners. And how God was able to change the program and do something to Paul that Paul was disqualified in receiving. God violently stopped ceased, ended Paul's history with the nation of Israel. The, the out-of-due-time birth of Paul is a violent death. Paul died 
in Acts chapter 9, spiritually speaking. He died to Israel. He died to the past. He died to prophecy. Now go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. So we, we want to recognize that Paul deliberately recounts who he was. Again, he, he, he's, he's telling us, I was disqualified in prophecy. He was one of those enemies. But, but now let's, let's keep reading. 1 Timothy chapter 1, again, verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained what? You know what God puts on display there in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus? Mercy. Mercy. But, but it doesn't stop there. You know, you talk about riches. Verse 14, and the grace. You know what God put on display in, in Acts chapter 9? Paul was an enemy. I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. But God reached out, ripped him right out of the prophetic program, and makes him a new creature. He does something to him. God's demonstrating his mercy. He's demonstrating in verse 14, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, of whom I am chief. He's not being melodramatic. He's not being self-deprecating. This is an absolute statement that Paul makes. When Paul calls himself the chief of sinners, remember what we just read there in the Acts account? He's the one giving consent. He's the one giving the approval. He's the one writing the service. You see, wait a minute. He was the chief of sinners. He was the leader. He was the object of this genocide against the little flock. Verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me what? First. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, I was the last. The last one to see him was Paul. As of one born out of due time. But here he says what? I'm the what? I'm the first. And he goes on and he says that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The Lord wants the church to know that Paul, his conversion, his commissioning, is the pattern. He's the first of all that God rightly can now do in this new dispensational purpose and program. And so you have the Apostle Paul, uh, since we're in 1 Timothy, go to chapter 2, verse 4, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified when? In due time. Hey, didn't we read that language in 1 Corinthians? Wait a minute. In due, wait a minute. Paul was born out of due time, but there is a due time period in which God is testifying that God gave his son as a ransom for how many people? You know what it says over there in John chapter, don't turn there, it talks about the Lord dying for the nation. Jesus Christ talks about this blood, uh, which is a ransom for many. Why is Paul talking about Jesus being a ransom for all, but to be testified in due time? Now notice what he says in verse 7, whereunto I, here we go again, Paul, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Ch uh, 2 Timothy, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 9, 2 Timothy 1, verse 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. When did he appear? Displaying his mercy, displaying his grace, displaying his long suffering when he ripped Paul right out of his mother's womb there on Acts chapter 9. 
but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought uh, life and immortality to light through the gospel. Look at verse 11, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Over and over again, I, I magnify my what? Office. So if we want to ask, answer the question, when did this information begun to be revealed. You know who we got to go to? The Lord keeps saying, look at what I did to this guy. And that's why Paul keeps talking about who he is as an apostle. Now, I want to end two passages, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and then Numbers chapter 16. Let's close here. And, and I just want you to, to recognize how important, how serious Numbers chapter 16. Let's go to Numbers chapter 16. And then we're in 2 Timothy. Paul, when he writes to Timothy, he says something here in 2 Timothy chapter 2. You know, Paul, he's describing uh, those that are going to subvert the gospel. He says, for example, in 2 Timothy 2 verse 14, 2 Timothy 2 verse 14, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to, to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers, right? So, so we know there's a, a program out there intended to subvert God's people. Verse 16, well, obviously we all know verse 15. Verse 16, but shun profane and what vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So Paul is warning Timothy of the impending apostasy that is already begun. And they're subverting the believers. They're contrary. They're antagonistic. They're resisting. They're lying. They're not rightly dividing the word of truth. They're, they're, when it comes to the truth, they, they're erring, right? Now, notice what Paul says in verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto uh, every good work. Listen, verse 19, Paul is not reteaching the doctrine of eternal security. Now, verse 19 is commonly taught that, oh, well, the Lord knoweth them that are his. I mean, does God know who his people are? Does God know who his children are? Yeah. Does God know who's saved and who's not saved? Yes, but that's not what Paul's talking about. That isn't the use of the passage here. No one can overthrow the foundation of God. God lays the foundation. By the way, who did God use to lay the foundation? Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Paul says, as a wise master builder, I have laid the what? Foundation. You can't, uh, no one can overthrow what God has laid, okay? But verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Now, in the context you have some that are, Paul is identifying, for example, Hamanaeus and Philetus. There are some who already are subversive, aren't they? They're already like a canker. They're already speaking profanity. And you understand profanity in the Bible. It's teaching lies about what God is doing. You go to Jeremiah 23. You want to know what profanity is? It isn't the four-letter word. It is profanity. Don't get me wrong. But in the Bible, according to Jeremiah, it is profane to claim that God's doing something that he's not doing. You understand why rightly dividing the word is so important? Because if you're teaching people that God is still operating under a time past program, that's profanity. If you're teaching people that, you know, we're still under the teachings of Jesus, of Nazareth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're speaking profanity. If you're trying to tell, somebody was telling me how, man, they were, you talk about Acts 2, and, uh, if, you know, if, if you insist that people need to prove they have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, you know, by speaking in tongues, vision, dream, you know what, you, you, you're, you're using profanity. 
So what Paul is telling Timothy is, look, here's the foundation. I laid it. And, and there is a, a wave, a tidal wave of, of deception that's swirling all about, seeking to uproot, seeking to subvert, seeking to deceive, lying, vain babblings, trying to tell God's people that, that God's operating back there in the past. So, so this is what Paul says. He says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. In what way? The Lord knoweth, he knows them that are going to protect the foundation. He knows, for example, look there at chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his what? The Lord knows who th those are that are going to stand on the foundation. They're going to build upon the foundation. They're going to protect the foundation. They're going to, they're going to uh, 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 defend the foundation. When, when, when Paul says the Lord knows who are his, he's not talking about who's saved and who's lost. He's talking about those who are faithful. Because in a house, as Paul describes, you've got some vessels onto what? Honor and some vessels of what? In the context, what's he saying? All of those vain babblers and all of those speaking profanity and being subversive, they're the vessels of dishonor. Now, you notice how in verse 19, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Numbers chapter 16. There is an incident here in the past. Two more minutes. Numbers chapter 16, verse 1. Now, Korah, the son of Esar, the son of Koath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and uh, Abar, uh, Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses and certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly. These are leaders. They've got some, obviously, recognition. They've got some respectability. They've got some uh, 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 capacity. They've got authority. Now, in verse 3, and they gather themselves together against who? Moses and against Aaron. But notice how verse 11 describes it. Verse 11, for which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the who? The Lord. There's an uprising in the camp. Who is the God-given spokesman for Israel? Moses. And what are these individuals now conspiring to do? We're going to challenge your authority, Moses. And they're now rising up against Moses. But Moses says, listen, you're not rising up against me. You know who you're rising up against? You're, you're rising up against the Lord. Now look at verse 5. Verse 5. Well, look at verse 4. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. He, he knows what's going on here. There's rebellion in the camp. Verse 5. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are what? You know what God's going to do? He's going to flesh out the honorable from the dishonorable. He's going to flesh out the faithful from the unfaithful. You know what Paul is warning Timothy about? There are vessels of dishonor out there the ones who refuse to rightly divide the word of truth. And the result is profanity and vain babblings that lead on to more ungodliness. He's challenging Timothy. Timothy, you be like I am. Don't be ashamed of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Be one of those within the ranks that are going to defend. Now, there's just... A couple of things, drop down to verse uh, 26. Uh, the language in number 16 is similar to the language of 2 Timothy. And, and if, uh, I know, how about one more minute? Just one more minute. Uh, I, I just want to compare a couple of verses here. Just, just compare the language in number 16, verse 21. Number 16, verse 21. Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Verse 26, and he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, 
from the tents of these what? Wicked men. Now, go back to 2 Timothy 2, and then we're going to close. So, number 16, Moses says, separate. He says, depart. Stay away from these wicked men. You notice how Paul in verse, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, the end of the verse, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from what? In the context, what's the iniquity? In the context, what is the cause of the profanity according to verse 15? They're not rightly dividing the word of truth. And then drop down to verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these. This is a real important warning that Paul, in his last letter to Timothy, as he's preparing Timothy for those perilous times, he's saying, listen, the Lord knows who are his. And he's challenging Timothy. Timothy, make sure you're on the right side here. Don't fall victim. Don't be a victim. To, to, and, and we understand what's happened to the church at large. They've done anything but stand on that foundation. They've done anything but rightly divide the word of truth. And the consequences have been devastating. Father, we do thank you for your grace and love and mercy and long-suffering that was manifested for the first time in and through the Apostle Paul dispensationally. We thank you, Lord, that uh, as our pattern, uh, we, we, we can learn. We learn uh, of his importance by... Uh, by way of apostleship, his importance by way of, of that conversion uh, that occurred there, especially uh, recorded in Acts chapter 9. We, we pray, Lord, that we would take to heart the seriousness of understanding uh, who it was you personally revealed uh, this information to, and certainly how subsequent to that it's now made known. Uh, we just thank you for your word in Christ's name. All right. Thank you, Brother Alex. He got the memo about the kind of pants to wear, too. I just noticed that. <laughs> All right.